sing day and night. Sing day and night, night and day, listen to us. Day and night, night and day, listen to us. Day and night, night and day, listen to us. Let your praise be lifted, God, like incense in this room. Let it be lifted day and night, God. Let your praise be lifted day and night, Lord. We want to smell the incense in the room, God. We want to smell it in this room today, Lord. Let it overflow. Let your praise overflow in us today, God. Hallelujah.
The atmosphere is changing now For the Spirit of the Lord is here The evidence is all around That the Spirit of the Lord is here Can we declare that today? The atmosphere is changing now. Feel the change for the spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around yeah. that the spirit of the Kingdom come 
call out to him this morning sing it out your kingdom come your will be done here as in heaven spirit of god for fresh on us in your presence Your presence here is like air that we need, Lord. We need you like air. Yes, Jesus, more than ever. We need your presence. We need your guidance. We need your fullness. When you feel us, there is no fear. There is no doubt. There is no confusion. There is peace, abundance of peace. There is joy unspeakable. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Take over. Take over. This is your church. Do what you want to do in this place. Take over. Heal the hearts. Heal the bodies. Lord, we bring our needs to you as a church. Lord, we need a touch from you. We ask, we pray in Jesus' name that you would touch these people that you would touch these families. One touch from you is enough. One word from you is enough to bring a breakthrough. Heavenly Father, speak to us. Speak to us. As it is written, He sent His word and He healed them. And so we ask your word. We ask that you would speak to us. In Jesus' mighty name, in Jesus' mighty name, we proclaim your healing, your breakthrough, your deliverance, and your salvation into these families. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray and we receive. We receive our breakthrough in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, worship team. Dear friends, you can take your seats. And first, we are going to watch our video about our weekly announcements and see what's happening. Welcome to Word of Life Church. A special welcome if it's your first time joining us. Before we get into the message this morning, here are a few quick announcements. Every Monday morning, we have intercessory prayer from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. And every Monday night is our weekly men's gatherings. Every Tuesday evening, we have prayers for prisons and rehabilitation centers. We have a midweek service on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. and a youth service on Friday nights at 7 p.m. And of course, you can't forget about the Sunday services. English service is at 10 a.m. and Armenian service at 12.30 p.m. This Wednesday for our midweek service, we will be having special guest Pastor Robert Mashbach. We're so blessed to offer a large variety of home groups to choose from. So if you don't have one already, find one that works best for you. We urge everyone to join the home group and fellowship and hear the word in a more intimate setting. We also offer prayer three times a day, six days a week. Such an amazing opportunity to spend time with the Lord. If you have it in your heart to help those who are in need, we also have a Care for the Homeless ministry that meets Saturdays at 10 a.m. We love to see the house of the Lord growing, and with a bigger family requires bigger space. Which is why we are excited to announce that we have begun the search for a new church building. So if you have it in your heart to sow into this project, please feel free to do so using the PushPay app or the envelopes on your seats and specify that it's for the renovation of the church. That's it for this morning's announcements. Be sure to join us throughout the week and stay connected with the Lord. May God bless you all. Praise God. And so uh, now I'm going to share a word about offering and our gifts that we bring every week before the Lord. And I'm going to read from Psalm 51, verse 16 to 19. 
and it is very interesting place. You would almost think that uh, we do bring our offerings, but the Lord says in verse uh, 16, the psalmist writes and says, You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous. It burns offerings offered whole, then bulls will be offered on your altar. And so, beloved, we see here that the Lord is not delight. He, he does not take delight in any sacrifice. It's not about bringing a sacrifice to the Lord. Because we know that even secular people, rich businessmen, powerful people, they always uh, bring part of their income and they share, uh, they donate it, they even give to churches. But does the Lord receive those sacrifices? And here we clearly say, uh, see that David writes that you're not delighted in these things. And the secret, the key, is the 17th verse. He writes and says, My sacrifice, a true sacrifice, is a broken spirit and a repentive, contrite heart. And God, you will not despise it. Beloved, this psalm was written after David committed uh, adultery and that, that horrible sin that he committed, even though he knew God, he was called a friend of God, but he, he fell. But we see that after the Nathan prof, the prophet, he came and he told him about his sin. What David did, he just broke his heart before the Lord. He humbled himself, and the only thing that he was thinking about, he was thinking about his relationship with the Lord. He was asking for forgiveness. He was asking, Lord, cleanse me. He would not care about anything else. And if I would really suggest you to read the whole psalm. It is really the most wonderful psalm of David, one of the best psalms. And he writes in the 10th verse, if you read, he writes and says, God create in me a clean heart, a clean heart. And so, beloved, the key is really this. The Lord does not really um, delight in a sacrifice or any sacrifice. He delights in a sacrifice that, is, um, that we bring with clean hearts. Amen? The hearts that are humble and repentive, hearts that do not regard sin in our hearts, uh, in another place, the Bible says, if I regard a sin, if I take pleasure in sin in my heart, you will not hear my cry. And so the Lord wants us to really humble ourselves. And we cannot really do this alone. 18 verse, David asks for help. He says, may it be pleasing to you, O Lord, to bless me, to help me. And we can do this. We can just... Before bringing our sacrifice, if we have struggles, if we have difficulties, issues, we can just humble ourselves and pray and say, God, help me. Help me. Cleanse my heart. I cannot do this alone. Help me with your Holy Spirit to please you. And then finally, the 19th verse, then you will delight in a sacrifice of the righteous. Amen. And so as we come to the uh, table of the Lord, right? When we come to communion, we prepare our hearts. We pray. We uh, say sorry for everything wrong that we did, you know, or thought. And we prepare our hearts for the Lord. And let's do the same thing when we bring the sacrifice. Come with prayer, with a humble heart. Hallelujah. Let's prepare our offering. Oh, Lord. We know that you're delighted in an offering of the righteous. Oh Lord, we are righteous through the blood of your Son. But also help us to live righteous lives. Fill us with your fullness, Holy Spirit. And give us strength.
to say no to the sin and to be obedient to you and to bring a proper sacrifices, sacrifices from a righteous heart. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Beloved, if you pray that from your heart, God is pleased with your sacrifice. You can boldly bring your sacrifice to Him. You can do it online through Pushpay app. You can put your envelope in the back. We have a box. May God bless you and may your sacrifice be accepted. Amen. Thank you. Into your hands I commit again You're all I am for you
Father, we thank you. Lord, we love you. And this morning we come before you and we ask you for grace, Lord. We ask you that your grace may be poured down upon us, that, Lord, your light would cover us like a garment and that you would make yourself known in our lives. Father, we are here for you. We are here for your glory. We are not here because of anyone's opinions or because of anything else, Lord, but we are here because we're seeking your face. We're seeking your kingdom. Our heart wants more of you. Our heart is thirsting and hungry for your word, for your presence, for what you have for us to lay a hold of eternity, to lay a hold of our destinies, to lay a hold of what you have for us, your eternal plans, for everything on this earth is temporary. So we are here, Lord, to seek something more. We are here because we have found the answer, and that is you, the way, the truth, and the life. So Lord, we pray this morning for your mercies renewed. We pray that your new, a new measure of grace would come upon us, and that Lord, you would be glorified in our lives forever that you may give us new desires in our heart, new desires for prayer, new desires for seeking you, new desires for your word, new desires, Lord, that will cause us to leave what is not of you, leave what is not from you, and to follow you, to follow your ways, to follow your footsteps. Have mercy on us where we've fell short, Lord. Have mercy on our mistakes and our sins. And I pray that you may lift us back up and show us your love and renew your love and, and your mercies in our life once again this morning. May your name be forever glorified in our life. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. That was amazing. We may be seated. Hallelujah. This morning, I'm so thankful to God um, for the opportunity to serve here, and I'm also thankful to my pastor, and I honor him, and I thank him for trusting me, um, because this is a big deal, and so thank you, pastor. I honor you, and I'm grateful for the opportunity that you've given me, and amen. We're so thankful to God. So today, you know, I, I have it on my heart that it's so important to be, to walk in the footsteps that God has ordained for us. And to walk in the footsteps that God has ordained for us is not just something that's physical, like walking physically. But because God is unseen and because God is a spirit, then the ways that God has are different than the ways that we think that we need to walk. So if physically you need to walk somewhere to get there or you need to drive somewhere to get there, with God, you don't need to walk and drive, but travel is different because God is a spirit and he's not in a body, in a human body. And so to walk the ways of God are different than what we've always imagined and what we think. When we think of walking, we think of physically walking somewhere to get there step by step. While there are steps and there are processes and it is a gradual thing, walking with God looks a little bit different. And today I want to cover something and I, I name this the unseen life um, or the secret life or something like that. Um, <laughs> the purpose is to demonstrate that the unseen life, thank you. The purpose is to demonstrate that we have a life that is also unseen, um, behind the scenes that also governs our life on earth that we walk. And so, so I want to start with, with um, a verse in the Bible. It's Matthew chapter 6, and it's verse 4. Uh, we can start at verse 3, actually. But it's basically about giving, um, and it says... But when you, when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And then verse 4, it says that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Amen. 
So it's important to understand now that every single one of us have a potential and every single human or every single man was created with a certain potential inside of them. And God made it this way when he said, and let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so every single person has great potentials because they have um, a piece of God that they were made with. They have the likeness and the image of God that they were originally created to reflect and, and designed to show. Now, just because somebody has potential and just because we carry a potential inside of us, it doesn't mean that that potential will manifest or that potential will be expressed. And that's why we don't marry based on potential because you might end up in a lot of trouble when that person doesn't reach their potential. So we don't say, oh, this person has so much potential because it really doesn't matter the potential someone has because everybody has potential. But the question is, will we reach the potential that is placed inside of us or will we fall short? And there are processes and there are ways that we walk and that we deal with God and that we deal with the happenings of life that will enable us to reach our maximum potential or to reach our destiny, or to reach the calling of God upon our life. And so those things are not always what they seem to be. And unfortunately for us, even as Christians, even as people who are born again, even as tongue-talking believers and, and people who, who, who know the Word of God and who, who know doctrine, even for us it's easy to miss the calling of God upon our life and really to engage with the potential that we have in our life because we don't know the ways of God. One of the most unfortunate things, I'm just going to go down for a minute, I'll go back up. One of the most unfortunate things, it's hard for the cameras to follow me when I'm... <laughs> One of the most unfortunate things in our lives is that, you know, the Bible says it like this. It says, God is a spirit and those who worship him he wants them to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so one of the most unfortunate things in the lives of a believer and in our lives is that we often carnalize God and we don't worship Him the way He's supposed to be worshipped. And we don't approach Him the way He's supposed to be approached. And so if God is a spirit and those who worship Him will worship Him in spirit and truth, that means that we have a spiritual aspect inside of us, we have an aspect inside of us that is eternal because we believed in Christ and He gave us eternity and He gave us the Holy Spirit, that means that we also have the ability to commune with Him and to interact with the eternal plans of God and the eternal ways and the eternal footsteps of God. Because the way that God moves um, is generally the same when you follow certain principles and you see that when you look at the lives of our patriarchs or our fathers of the faith in the Bible. Every single one of them, they had something about them that was similar to the other. For, for example, they always had a prayer life. They always knew the Word of God. They always set up altars to pray. They always gave sacrifices. So the ways of God are eternal and God has given us an ability to come into alignment with His ways and come into alignment with His great callings and eternal plans for our lives by following certain principles and following His footsteps. Now, where we go wrong is we fail to realize that God is a spirit and in Him and in the spirit is where our calling and our potential and everything that we need for life and godliness lies. Because the Bible says that He has blessed us with blessings um, in heavenly places, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So the Bible is making it clear that in God and in heavenly places are our blessings and our inheritance. So our inheritance is not stored up in a bank account and our inheritance is not stored up in a land or a real estate or a boat or cars or anything like that. But our inheritance is stored up in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so in order to reach our inheritance and in order to um, collect our inheritance, it will take us to take a journey and to take a search into, into the spirit where God lives and the spirit where God dwells and the spirit where everything that God has made for us resides. And that is the main problem that we have 
and why we miss out on our calling and why we miss out on the great plans of God for us and why oftentimes we fall short of the life that God wants us to live and the things that God wants us to do. So first of all, it's incredibly important to understand that every single person, every single one of us who carries the Holy Spirit, who has given their life to Christ, even if they have not given their life to Christ, as humans they still have potential to do evil too. So it's important to understand that every single person has a certain potential and there's a place where potentials are birthed and conceived. There's a place where men are made. There's a place where wealth is made. There's a place where power comes from. And all of these things happen in a similar place. And that's why I call this the unseen life. And it has to do with the secret place. So the Bible says that when you give secretly to the poor, or when you give secretly in general without letting your um, left hand know what your right hand is doing, the Bible says that God himself will, open, uh, will openly reward you. So there's a certain reward or there's a certain consequence that comes with doing something in secret. And so, and so we, we as believers have to value now more than outward appearances and more than outward shows and spectacles, we have to value more of what's done in secret. Because the Bible said that don't give like the heathens do, like making it known to everyone. Don't pray like they do, making it known to everyone and going to the streets and babbling. But he said, but go to your secret place, close the door, and the things that you say in secret your father hears you and your father will give you according to that. So we are rewarded as people and as children of God by the things that we do in the secret place or by the things that we do in the life that is not seen by other men but is only seen by God. And so in knowing that, it's extremely important that you maintain a great understanding and a good understanding of who you are because at the end of the day, the Bible says that when you're born again, you're not born um, by blood or you're not born by flesh, but you're born by the seed of God, the incorruptible seed of God. And God, and the reason that Jesus even came in the first place was to, was to give us a new doctrine that we were not open to. And it was the, the, the principle and the doctrine that God is our father. And he wants to have a relationship with us as a father. And so as he came and he gave us the gift of salvation, he gave us the ability to be engrafted into sonship, to be engrafted into being a son of God, being a child of God, and knowing God as our father. And so Jesus came as the first one, and he made a way for us to also believe in him and to inherit the same sonship that he had and gave it to us. So as believers, it's number one important for you to understand that you are sons of God and that God is more interested in what is unseen more than that which is seen. That's why you can look so powerful and you can look so good in front of other people and you can do great works for everyone and feed the homeless and this and this. But in your heart, there's plenty of bitterness. In your heart, there's plenty of unforgiveness. In your heart, there's plenty of pride. There's shame. There's guilt. There's insecurities. And so because you do things outwardly doesn't make you any more of a better person to God because God is a spirit. So it doesn't matter the things that you do outwardly until first the unseen life and the inner man is fixed and healed. And that's why the work that Christ has with us first begins with the inner man and not the outward appearance because the Bible says that when you believe in him that you you're now a, a new creature you're a new you're a new creature you the old things have passed away you have become born again and you have changed completely the Bible says that the old man is put away with and now it's the behold it's the new man that lives so when that thing changes it's not the outward physical appearance that changes other people can see that you completely changed and you became a new person but it's what lives inside of you that has changed and has become a new man that has become a new being that has become redeemed and so God is more concerned with with first 
what he does inside of you and the change and the impact that he makes inside of you more than what you do on the outside. And that's why the Bible says that our works are like filthy rags to him. So any work that you do, if it's not done by the inspiration of God, it's like a filthy rag. You can't please God with your works. God doesn't need anyone to do works for him because we're sinners and we've fallen short of his sight. And he doesn't appreciate things that we are used to being appreciated when we do them. So he doesn't appreciate temporary works because they're temporary. But if we first fix ourselves and align ourselves to God inside of us and in the unseen realm and in the unseen life, then when we do works, they will be counted by God. And the Bible says that at the last day, every work will be tested and the ones that are not approved by God, they will burn away. And some people, they will do so many works, but they will get to heaven. And the fire that tests the works of men will burn them. And they will bear, the Bible says they will hardly even be saved. Because the works that they did were not eternal. And they were not fit for God. Even though this person might have preached to one million people and brought souls to Christ. If inside their works were not done by the inspiration of God and they were not in alignment with his will and his callings, then this person's works will be burned and they will go away and they will count for nothing in their life. The rewards will not come with it. And so it's extremely important to understand that more than your outward appearance and more than the things that you do outwardly, more than just taking care of your family, more than just taking care of your loved ones, more than just working, more than just even going and evangelizing and preaching, and more than doing all of those things, what's most important is to first focus on the secret place or your unseen life, the place where destinies are our birth the place where destinies change the place where things happen first begins in the realm that is unseen it is the place where even wealth is created when you see people who are successful who are wealthy it did not start with all this money and, and this business and things like this. It started when no one was looking the things that they were focused on the things that they were doing in the secret place that nobody knew it started with them changing their mind because though they might have grown up in a certain way, they first had to change their mind and have an abundance, abundance mindset. And then they had to change things inside of them to become the person that will be the wealthy one. So you have to, as a son of God, become the person that will be the one that will have the inheritance from God. You have to become the one that God will trust with his inheritance. That's why the Bible says that as long as you are still a child, you are still a slave in your master's house. But when you mature and you become a son, you are now qualified to have the inheritance. Because the inheritance of God is not something that's the, the, the inheritance of your life, the inheritance that is your calling, your, your greatness your expansion, your territorial dominion. These things are not things that are just given away like this, like easily, because you need to become the person that will steward those things well. So it's extremely important to understand that your unseen life is important. And now, in order to get to that conclusion, you first have to understand who you are, and you have to understand what the potential is that you carry so then you can actualize the potential in who you are so number one you have to understand that you yourself are a manifestation of god's thoughts the reason that you exist is because of god's thoughts and so god thought something and you came into existence because he first thought about you thought about creating you the bible says let us make man in our image after our uh, in our image and after our likeness meaning god thought about making you and then he made you he said jeremiah before you were even born before you were in your, in your mother's womb i knew you he says i know the thoughts i have concerning you so there were thoughts before we were even conceived and because of these thoughts we existed we were not we were not an accident. We were very thought out. And what you carry 
is the the who, now what you carry as a as a person as a human are the thoughts of God in your own members in your own um, being you carry the thoughts of God in your life because when God says let us make man in our image after our likeness what God wants to do is like replicate himself for the earth and that's why the Bible says in 1st John chapter 4 I think verse 17 it says and as he is speaking of Jesus so are we in this earth meaning as God created us he wanted us to be a another model of him so that we can have dominion over his own creation so when we come and we believe in Christ something amazing happens and that is the Bible says that we we are engrafted into the body of Christ so as God as Christ is the head we have now become the body when we accepted him and we believed in him and that's also why the Bible says that you, you know, don't, don't speak bad about your brother, don't gossip, don't do, don't have petty arguments, don't have strife, don't, because we're all part of the same body. What kind of a hand would hate, what kind of a left hand would hate the right hand? What kind of a, what kind of a thumb would argue with the rest of the body? It doesn't make sense. Or what kind of a, what kind of a left leg would think it's better than the right leg? We all are one body. And so when you come to Christ and you accept Him and you, you believe in Him, you are engrafted now into the body of Christ. So as Christ is the head, we are the body, meaning Christ is the one that thinks and transfers our thoughts to His body. Because uh, even, even the way that like, uh, thoughts work in the, in, in the neurons and stuff like that, you first, a thought is conceived, um, and then when you decide something, your brain basically communicates it to the rest of the body to move it and, and to do whatever. So when your arm is moving, it's because of the, the neurons that are acting in your body. So it comes from your head. And so why I'm saying that is because Christ is the one who has the thoughts and the plans for our life, and we're the ones who carry them out. So we as humans, as followers of Christ and as believers of Him, we are carriers of the thoughts of God. And in order for the thoughts of God to be carried out on the earth, it has to go through a man to think it and then to do it. So if God wants to build a school, he will, his, his thoughts will just appear in someone else's life. And they will start thinking, I want to build a school. And they, they will have these thoughts and they will think it's their own desires. But it was actually something that God thought. And because you are the body and Christ is the head, you are subject to do what your head tells you to do. So God will, um, will, he, God will accomplish his will through people on this earth. And we are like... A tr uh, we help transition and bring the will of God from a thought to a reality. So, but where does the where what where does this come? Where does the expression come from, or where does the thought come from, and how do we give it expression? So, we have to understand now that we have to first have a thought and then the thought has to come into conception so when the thought comes and when the word of god comes the bible calls the word of god a seed so the seed will come into your life which is the word of god and that's why there's a parable um i have i have it somewhere there's a parable in the bible where there's a sower who's sowing seeds, and some of the seeds fall into good soil, and they grow, and they become good. Some of the seeds fall into, like, rocks, and then, like, birds eat them. Some of the seeds fall into thorns, and some of them fall into, like, a shallow ground, so they grow a little bit, but then they're passed away. And Jesus said that this parable is talking about when the Word of God enters into the different hearts of men. So, when the Word of God enters you, it's a seed that has entered you. Now, the seed doesn't have to grow. The seed can be removed. The seed can be 
like killed, aborted, it can be not taken care of, and it won't grow into what it's supposed to grow. It was supposed to grow into a, a giant tree, and that tree was supposed to provide shade, and the tree was supposed to provide housing for many animals and many birds, and it was supposed to provide shade for many people, many animals, and it was supposed to be like an environment and an ecosystem, but the seed that entered your heart died because of doubts, because of fear, and because in your secret place and in the unseen world, you didn't pay attention and ten, uh, um, tend to the seed. So as the Word of God enters you, it can enter as a thought, but the Word of God also has to have a conception with you so that it can be conceived, so that something can be born from it. Because conception happens in the secret place, in every realm of human endeavor. So in order for you to birth the plans of God for your life and in order for you to birth the callings of God and the eternal plans of God in order for you to host them and bring them into manifestation what has to first happen is a seed has to come and enter you which is the thoughts of God and the plans of God and you also have to conceive that seed and 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 carry it out into the point that you actually give it birth so the Bible says in first Chronicles chapter uh, 28 verse 9 it says basically um, serve him wholehearted serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind for the Lord searches every heart and understands every motive behind the thoughts so it says with wholehearted devotion so with your entire heart and with your mind, with the willing mind. So God is looking for you to seek Him with your entire heart and devote yourself in your heart and with your mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every motive behind the thoughts or every intent behind the thoughts. And so you now have become an incubator for the thoughts and the plans of God and for the ideas of God. You've now become the one who incubates them and takes care of them until they're actually grown and they, they manifest in the physical world. Just like how when a woman is pregnant, for the nine months she's incubating the child. She's, it, it, the, the, food, it, the food, the nutrition, um, everything that the child needs is being like, it's like a laboratory basically, and it's being fed and taken care of until it's, uh, the original thought is ready to now give birth. Now the birth happens and the baby is conceived. So you are an incubator of God's eternal plans and thoughts and ideas of God. And, and the ideas of a man and the vision of a man and the plans of a man are one with the man. So you are only as great as your vision. You are only as great as your accomplishments. And you are only as great as um, what you can accomplish. It's the same thing. It's one. And that's why when you are getting married and you're looking for a husband, you're not looking necessarily for a man, but you're looking for a vision because you marry yourself and you attach yourself to the vision that the man has. So as a man, we are one with our vision. And as a human, we are one with our vision. And when our vision is aligned with God, then we have positioned ourselves to be a carrier of his own will. So the, the, the problem is now that as we were born into this earth, we were born into basically the devil's playground. And the Bible says that the devil is the prince of the power of the air. So he's the ruler of the powers of the air. So when you're born, you're immediately at a disadvantage because the devil rules the air and he rules the airways and he rules... Um, the atmosphere and the thoughts that come into men. So automatically you are born with a disadvantage and your thoughts are always headed towards not the plans of God, but the plans of the devil. Not the environment that God wants to create inside of your secret place, but the environment that the devil wants to create inside of your secret place. Because every single 
thought, every single intention, every desire, and every emotion, everything that you can basically have secretly, it creates an atmosphere for some sort of a spirit to dwell. And that's why when you worship God and you're completely devoted and focused on Him, the atmosphere that created inside of you draws the attention of God because He says, I love worship. Those who worship me will worship me in spirit and in truth. And you create an atmosphere inside of your spirit that's, a wor that's worship. And so God appears and says, this is a sweet smelling fragrance to me. That's why the Bible says that God will inhabit the praise of his people. Because the second you praise God, you tune yourself to a frequency that God is attracted to. You tune yourself to an atmosphere that God is attracted to. And in the same way, if you're born in the world and the devil is the prince of the power of the air, your thoughts are now reflective of that truth. And your thoughts now create a, a, a breeding ground for, for gossip and for lies and for manipulation and for insecurities and for everything that the devil likes. Because in the same way that you attract God with atmospheres, you also attract other spirits with strange atmospheres that God does not like to be around. So in doing so and in gossiping and in having insecurities and in giving yourself to them in giving yourself to unholy anger and envy and strife and gossip and things like this, in giving yourself to them, you're creating an environment inside of you that will choke the very seed of God that's in you, choke the thoughts of God out and abort what God wants to do through you. So, in, in both ways, there are seeds that are being planted, and either way, the seed has to be incubated to grow. There can even be an evil, seed, an evil seed that is inside of you that starts off with, I really don't like how my nose looks, or I really don't like how my body looks, or my eyebrows look, or something like this. And the thought is just a seed that was planted, but that thought, once it's incubated and once it's given so much attention to, it can lead to, I need to end my life because... I am a horrible person and God doesn't love me. Because the devil planted a seed and you incubated that seed. You took care of that seed. You gave it attention. You gave it your mindfulness. You did everything inside of you that was perfect for that seed to grow. So in the same way, when God speaks to us and God wants to reveal his plans to us and God wants to manifest his plans in our life and in our generation... God will give us a seed. And the measure in, in how well we take care of it will determine the manifestation that we will see of the very seed of God in our life. And when the seed now grows, you have to understand that the seed is because it, the, the seed is the word of God or the word of the devil. They're, they're both seeds. So when the seed of God begins to grow, it matures and the Word of God now takes residence in your life and residence in your members and residence in your body. You rejected sickness because you said that by His stripes you're healed and that there's no sickness and things like this for people who are in Christ. And so eventually a day will come where you've meditated upon that, where you've believed it, where you've confessed it, and you've warred against the contrary thoughts and the contrary plans that were against your life. And a day will come where the Word will be manifested. And the Bible says when Jesus came that the Word became flesh. So the Word of God and the seed of God is always looking for expression and is always looking for a host. That's why the Bible says the Word became fl flesh because the Word was eternal and it was outside of time and things like this. And the Bible says that without the Word, nothing was created. Without the Word, um, nothing can be. And then the Bible says in John chapter 1 verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the Word of God has the ability to become flesh and to materialize itself through a human vessel. So Jesus was the manifestation of the Word of God in the flesh because He was the human vessel that hosted 
the very word of God, the very eternal plans of God, the very plans of God for salvation for all of humanity that we saw throughout the entire Old Testament was hosted in a vessel called Jesus that, that carried that seed and the entire life of Jesus was spent nurturing that seed, nurturing that plan, nurturing that, that goal in order for that will of God to be given expression on the earth. So without Jesus hosting that word, without Jesus incubating that word and taking care of that seed that was God's thoughts, we would not have salvation today. And, and if he had missed the mark to carry out the plans of God, billions of souls would suffer and perish. Because one person didn't obey and didn't properly tend the word of God in their life, the plans of God in their life. Maybe Jesus would care more about money. Maybe when the devil came and offered him the kingdoms, he would say, yeah, this is good. I'll take the kingdoms. Maybe when temptations came, he would have given up. Maybe when people came and said, Oh, Jesus, people aren't accepting us. Should we call fire by them? Maybe he would have said, yeah, call fire, destroy the whole city. He would have said, oh, these people are, these people, they're not good anyway. They suck. Maybe he would have done something wrong and had wrong thoughts and aborted that calling inside of him. Maybe lust would have taken over and greed would have taken over. And when 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 people were coming after him and chasing him, he would have let it get to his head and, and, and drawn more towards people than to God. But the principles that governed the life of Christ were the things that he needed to be kept in the calling of God and the purpose of God. So while there are distractions everywhere in your life and while there are contrary thoughts and contrary temptations and contrary urges, you have to understand that it's extremely important to give yourself to the voice of God and the thoughts of God and the will of God. You see, because how you end up going in a wrong direction and how you end up spiraling in a wrong direction is by giving your thoughts, your emotions, your urges, your feelings, your words, giving all of those things to the wrong, putting them in the wrong direction and giving them to the wrong, uh, like they find a wrong expression because you gave them to the wrong voice that was leading you. So the, where you think, how you think, the direction that you think is where you go. And you learn this in every area of life, even physically. If you're surfing, you can't look down on the board because you're going to go down. That's, what you're, that's the first thing your surfing instructor will tell you. You can't look down. You have to look at the direction you're going so you can go there. If you're um, doing any sort of strenuous act, if you're driving a car, you can't look back and drive forward because you won't successfully do it. So you have to look where you're going. So your thoughts are your sight spiritually and your thoughts will determine where you're going but if you give those thoughts to the wrong direction then you will end up in the wrong direction because you gave yourself to the wrong voice and to the wrong seed you took care of the wrong seed because the wrong thought came and you 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 um liked it and you incubated it and you dwelt upon it and you meditated on it and it became who you are because the bible says as a man thinks so is he your emotions, when they come, your anger can come. And the, the Bible says, let your, and, let your anger come. You can be angry, it's okay. But don't sin. And don't let the sun go down on your anger. But you can give expression to this emotion in the wrong way. And what was possibly something that was godly turned into something that was wrong. And it steered you away from the plan of God because now... You slept and the anger is still there. You woke up with bitterness towards that person. And everything, that person was supposed to help you in the future, but you already cut ties with them and burnt the bridges. And all of these things happened because of bitterness in your heart. You were supposed to wake up in the morning and pray and thank God and come into alignment with Him. 
and God was supposed to tell you something that would change your life forever, but instead you had bitterness and you didn't get up to pray and you were still bitter and you killed the very seed that God planted in you or that God wanted to plant in you because the atmosphere was not fit for God. The atmosphere was not fit for God to come and impregnate you with his will and his plan. So imagine as a man how much power you have if your emotions, your thoughts, your words, um, your desires, your actions, these things determine whose will you're under, who you're subjected to, and where you go. And the moment you decide to change how you think, the moment you decide to change how you walk, the moment you decide to change how you deal with certain emotions, for example, instead of, instead of when you're angry, instead of having an argument with your spouse or with your friends, you, you know how you get when you're angry, so you say, okay, I'm going to step out and cool down and seek God and find peace, and then we'll come back and resolve it. That decision can change something inside of you that if you were to be angry, you would have felt the conviction of God, you would have felt something is not right, you would have dis disconnected yourself from the source and ended up in a wrong direction, maybe even done something that you would have regretted in the, pa in the future, but because of the decision that you made, because you redirected your emotions in a godly way and according to scriptures, you find yourself staying in the will of God and you find yourself still experiencing the presence of God and not aborting the seed that God had planted in you. So if you have the power to change these things and you have the power to control them and you have the power to steer them in the way that you should go, then think about how much... Um, responsibility and power God has given you to decide where you end up. The reason why we are where we are is because of those things, because of the spirit that we gave ourselves to, because of the thoughts, the emotions, the urges that we gave ourselves to. Um, and I wrote notes so I can stay focused on what I'm speaking about and there's like I would say like eight sections and I was on number one. So, <laughs> so it's okay. <laughs> so the, this, is also, this is also what the devil is after. He's after your ability to f express his thoughts and his wills and his plans. This is also what God is after, his ability to express his thoughts and his wills and his plans. So who you give yourself to and what you give yourself to and the principles that you align yourself to will determine where you go. They will determine, um, they will determine the abilities inside of you that you will give expression to. And I'll just, finish with, I'll just finish with this example that I'll give you so that you can understand more um, what I mean. As a, as a human and as a man that's made in the image of God, you have many abilities that are inside of you. You have many dormant abilities that have not fully found expression yet. And when you... So, for example, if you go to the gym, you have abilities that were dormant inside of you that if you train yourself and you work out and you put pressure on yourself, give it four months, six months, 12 months later, you will come out looking like a different person. But you always carried those abilities. You always carried the ability to express that potential, but you never did it. So it remained dormant until you actually put pressure in that area and you worked out that area and you gave time to that area and you gave time to your diet and you gave time to the, the word. The, you, you, you gave your hungers and your thirsts uh, to a different area. You gave your lusts and your desires to a different area. And that's why the Bible says, focus on things that are not seen. Focus on the unseen. Because as you focus on that, you give yourself to those things and you then express those things more than other things. So the, there's abilities inside of you 
that have remained dormant for so long. There's abilities inside of us that God wants to manifest, that God wants to reveal His glory through, reveal Himself through to, to your family, to your coworkers, to your community, to, to the nations. And because of your inability to train yourself, the Bible says, and training ourselves and, and um, like training ourselves in our godly faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, because of your negligence of spiritual principles and laws, you have so much potential. You have the Spirit of God living inside of you, but every potential inside of you is dormant and can't find expression because it, it, you haven't trained it, you haven't stirred it up. That's why the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, stir up the gift that's within you. There's a gift that's within you that needs to be stirred. For it to find expression in the lives of men, in the hearts of men, there, the gift has to be stirred. The gift has to be tended to. It has to be worked. It has to be taken care of. There's a peace inside of your spirit that you have neglected and you haven't given expression to. So your whole life you're filled with with disappointments your whole life you're filled with anxiety with stress with pressure because the peace that's in you already from Christ has failed to find expression through you you have patience you have love inside of you that wants to find expression but you haven't given it the the fuel it needs to manifest itself you have gifts of the Holy Spirit you have powers from God. You have life-changing abilities that are dormant inside of you that you have failed, you have neglected to take care of and to grow and to raise. So the people, so, so that results in you suffering, that results in you living outside the plan of God, that results in your heart not feeling content, and that results in the people you were supposed to reach, now they're also suffering. So imagine the abilities that are dormant inside of you. Imagine the, the gifts that are dormant inside of you because you neglect prayer. Prayer is a true mark of a believer, is a true mark of someone who's going after Christ. When you see the life of Christ, always prayer. He started with prayer, he maintained it with prayer, he would go and serve and go home and pray, he, he did night vigils, he stayed up and he prayed, communed with his father. He was a very diligent person in the word of God, he was a very diligent person in his, in his meditations, his thoughts, watching over his emotions, making sure that people's words and emotions don't plant seeds in him and grow. He was very careful with those things. So how much more should we be? Jesus knew best. Jesus knew best. So let God find expression through you. Allow God to use you as a vessel. Allow God to use you. Allow God to use you as an expression of Him because He wants full dominion and the way that God has dominion is by man having dominion because everything goes back to Him anyway. So as a man when you come into alignment with the plan of God, with the will of God for your life, when you find yourself in that space because of your unseen life, because of your secret life, it lines up with God. The spiritual side of things, the unseen things, line up with the God that is also unseen. So as you line yourself up, your source now guides you. Your directions are guided by the Spirit. Your discernment grows. When you give yourself to principles of life, when you give yourself to the principles of God, when you give yourself to prayer, you will see that it is not only prophets who see visions. You will see that it is not only certain people that have divine guidance from God. You will see that though you didn't know how to differentiate what's God's voice, how do I hear God's voice? After time of 
of prayer, after time of travailing, after time of giving yourself sacrificially, you will see that one day you will wake up and just like Samuel, you will hear your name. You won't know what it is, but you will hear something and you won't be able to ignore it because you have tuned yourself to the frequencies of God. Some antennas in you that were dormant now begin to find expression and you become what you were supposed to be. You, you get in alignment with who you're supposed to be. So let us stand on our feet as we end. So you are a product and a result and your life is a product and a result of the decisions that you make, of the choices that you make, of the spirits that you yield to, of the atmosphere that you yield to. You as a human, you have so much power that if you think about something for long enough, if you, if you give yourself to something long enough, inside of you an atmosphere will be created. If you think about all the good things that God has done for you, if you think about all the reasons why you should be thankful, that you started this year and you had great plans for the year and someone else did too, but that other person made it to halfway through the year and they weren't able to come home because of a tragedy that happened. If you give yourself to being grateful for what you have, you think they're little things, but God doesn't do little things. If you give yourself to gratefulness, gratitude, prayer, a life of worship, you will see that you create an atmosphere inside of you because of your God-given nature that will attract more of God to you because God loves joy. His throne is surrounded by it. God loves worship. God loves thanksgiving. He always shows up. The Bible says, and enter into His gates with thanksgiving. Enter into His courts. Praise Him. So there's ways to approach God. There's ways to, there's ways to, hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are giving us grace. As you have released your word, oh God, my prayer is for all of us that you will release also your grace. Give us the grace, Lord to repent for what we need to repent of. Give us the abilities to stand and stay strong. Lord, to wake up to reality, to who we are, to what you've given us, because it's so much better than anything we could have asked for. Father, bring us into a new consciousness. Bring us into a new realm of thinking. Give us grace and mercy. Help our focus be on things that are unseen, not the things that are seen, so that we may give expression to your spirit, so that, Lord, the, the gift, the great gift that you've given us of the Holy Spirit, the great abilities that you've given us of, of God, the great abilities of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that they will not remain dormant inside of us, that, Lord, may we be the person that gives expression to you. May we be the person that when people see us, they will know that Jesus is still alive. That he surely lives. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Spirit of God, for fresh all